As always, I'm thankful to be before you to deliver a message from God's Word. We didn't coordinate. However, many of the songs that we've just sang thus far dealt with different aspects of this morning's lesson. Now, I won't ask for a show of hands. Who has ever been cut to the point of bleeding? I know I've got several scars that caused me to bleed when they were fresh, some of which are still visible. I tried to catch a turkey one time, and it has sharp claws, and it let me know, and I bled for a while. And I can look at my hand, and I can remember that incident. Who has ever donated blood before? Who has ever needed a blood transfusion before? If you listen to the radio at all or even have a phone, you'll hear ads, receive calls from the Gulf Coast Blood Center telling us to donate our blood to help various cancer patients. They're pointing to the effectiveness of blood, the need for blood. However, in this secular world, this concept of blood being useful to the body is relatively new. Now, just as with many cultures, to the ancient Egyptians, the practice of bloodletting was an approved method of practice. It was an accepted practice. Now, their concept of removing blood from one's body for medicinal purposes evidently came from the hippopotamus. You see, they believed that the hippo would intentionally scratch itself to cause itself to bleed in order to relieve its own distress. Well, they were sadly mistaken. For when they saw the hippo and they see the red liquid being secreted from that hippo's body, it's not blood. That's sweat coming into contact or contact with the oxygen in the air. And this happens every time a hippo sweats. It's not actually their blood. But nonetheless, they develop this process of bloodletting because of the hippo. Throughout the Middle Ages, Bloodletting was employed due to a fever. And it was used to attempt to treat several other diseases. It was also used as a form of therapy. Barbers were typically the ones who practiced bloodletting. And if you've ever been to a barber and you see that pole outside their door, looks like a peppermint stick that's spinning, well, this is where that comes from. The the red represents the blood, and the white represents the bandage. They even used bloodletting to cure a broken heart. No doubt bloodletting would cure every illness you had, because it would end your life. Eventually, leeches were used for this process of bloodletting. Around the 1830s, and from there onward, France would import roughly 40 million leeches every year for this particular purpose. Throughout the same period of time, England would import around 6 million leeches per year. Though lessening in use, bloodletting would continue throughout the 20th century. In fact, Sir William Osler wrote a textbook approving of such a practice was put into print around 1923, The Principles and Practices of Medicine. Thankfully, the practice of bloodletting has been shown to be ineffective, and use of its treatment has since been limited to very rare applications and instances. Man has been largely ignorant of the significance and power of blood. Yet, through advancements in medical technology, we've been able to undercover 
uncover the usefulness and power of blood. However, God has made this simple biological principle known very early in our history. Leviticus chapter 17 verse 11 states that life is in the blood. So this morning I would like for us to discuss the significance of blood in the Bible. First off, what exactly is blood? <clears throat> blood can be divided into four basic components. Red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, and plasma. Red blood cells make up about 40 to 45 percent of the blood by volume and are produced by one's blood or bone marrow. The body is able to produce roughly four billion cells per hour and each of these blood cells last about 120 days in one's body after which they will be recycled by the body to be used in other areas. Hemoglobin is the chemical complex that give, its, or give these cells its red color. It's a complex of iron. Red blood cells transport oxygen from the lungs to the tissues that need oxygen. And they also help remove waste from the body. White blood cells, these are our attacking cells. They defend the body. They're part of the immune system. They only make up about 1% of the blood by volume. They're able to even go into tissue to attack and fight against foreign substances such as bacteria and viruses. Then there are platelets. These are little plate-looking fragments of cells that help control bleeding. So whenever you bleed and your blood starts coagulating, the platelets are why. <clears throat> Hence the name. When a wound occurs, a signal is sent, and these platelets arrive at the wound. And from there, they turn into a, an active form, and they sprout little tentacles. And they start attaching to other platelets, and they start attaching to the blood vessel, and they form clusters, thus plugging the wound to allow proper healing. <clears throat> and then there's plasma, which makes up about half, 50, 50 to 55% of blood by volume. This is the liquid portion of blood. It's primarily made up of water, sugar, fat, protein, salts, and hormones. Plasma transports water and nutrients to the body tissues. It also transports the cells, the red blood cells, waste, and antibodies. <clears throat> and it helps provide a balance to the body's fluid balance. Maintain equilibrium within the blood. As we referenced earlier, blood is essential to life, both to humans and animals. Due to this, it has always been wrong for man to eat blood. God permitted Noah and his family to eat animal flesh in Genesis chapter 9, verses 3 through 6. However, under this law of patriarchy, he gave but one restriction. And that is that they could not eat blood of those animals. We see under the law of Moses in Leviticus chapter 7, verses 26 and 27, the same restriction is given. Moreover, you shall eat no manner of blood, whether it be a fowl or a beast, in any of your dwellings. Whatsoever soul it be that eateth any manner of blood, even that soul shall be cut off from his people. And we see this principle echoed in Acts chapter 15, verses 28 through 29. Blood has always been forbidden for mankind to eat. In Leviticus chapter 17, verses 10 and 11, we're given why. It says, And whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn among you, that eateth any manner of blood, I will set my face against that soul that eateth blood, and will cut him off from among his people. Verse 11, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, 
and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. In verse 12, Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, No soul of you shall eat blood, neither shall any stranger that sojourneth among you eat blood. God has put life in the blood. Thus blood that is shed is used for atonement of the soul. Next, let's consider the significance of blood under the law of patriarchy. We see that in the very beginning, blood needed to be shed. We are presented with the fall of man in Genesis chapter 3, verses 6 and 7, which reads, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat. And gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. <clears throat> you see, upon disobeying God, their eyes were opened. And they sought clothing, they sought a covering. Yet the fig leaves that they sought and used to make aprons were insufficient. Then we find in Genesis chapter 3 verse 21, Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them. Why is this significant? With the first sin came the first animal sacrifice. Where did the coats of skins come from that God used? And did God only clothe them physically? We see from this verse that God gave them sufficient covering. He gave it for their physical shame, which was their nakedness. And he gave them a covering for their spiritual shame, which is their sin. This was accomplished by the shedding of blood. <clears throat> We find similar significance in the account of Cain and Abel, where these brothers offer their sacrifices to God. Yet we see that Abel offered according to faith, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. Cain did not. And as a result, God respected Adam and his offering. This sacrifice was of blood, Genesis chapter 4, verses 3 through 7. <clears throat> The, the offering of Abel testified of his righteousness before God. Then, after the floodwaters had subsided, we see in Genesis chapter 8, verses 20 through 22, that Noah offered sacrifices to God. He took animals of those clean beasts, and he offered them upon an idol, or an altar, excuse me, certainly not an, an idol, but he made these sacrifices according to faith. And we see that God called these sacrifices, the aroma arising from them, a sweet savor. Now, I enjoy the smell of meat grilling on the grill, but that's not the concept that's being contemplated here. The smell of the sacrifice, this burnt offering, was not the focus. The focus was what that smell represented. And that was the substitution, atonement for sin. This appeased God's wrath and even prompted a promise to where God would no longer smite the earth because of the sin of the people thereon. In the final days of the Egyptian bondage for Israel, we see that a Passover was instituted. Exodus chapter 12, verses 5, and 5 through 7, as well as uh, verses 12 and 13. Exodus chapter 12, verse 5 says, Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. 
And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses, wherein they shall eat it. And verses 12 and 13 gives the reason why. God says, For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and I will smite the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Blood on the doorpost signified the obedience of those inside the house. And this would cause God to pass over that house. And he would smite all other houses without the blood around the door. So blood was a significant component of the law of patriarchy. We've seen in each of these scripture references. Third, let us note then the significance of blood under the law of Moses. Animal sacrifice was similar to that of patriarchy. Exodus chapter 29 verses 15 through 18. Which reads, Thou shalt also take one ram, and Aaron and his son shall put their hands upon the head of the ram, and thou shalt slay the ram, and thou shalt take his blood, and sprinkle it round about the altar, and thou shalt cut the ram in pieces, and wash the inwards of him and his legs, and put them into his pieces, or unto his pieces, and unto his head, and thou shalt burn the whole ram upon the altar. It is a burnt offering unto the Lord. It is a sweet savor, an offering made by fire unto the Lord. These sentiments are also seen in verse 25 of the same chapter, as well as Leviticus chapter 1, verse 9, and verse 13. Now notice the process of this burnt offering sacrifice. The priests were to lay their hands upon the head of this ram. Why? it would cause them to sit up and take note of the innocent life that was about to be taken from this ram. This life was about to be taken and used in their stead. Have you ever seen a lamb, a little baby sheep or a baby goat? They're frolicking about in the pasture. When I was younger, we raised sheep and goats. We had cows as well. But when you see this little kid, that's what they're called, it's kids, because when they holler, they sound just like a, a little kid, human kid, that is. But you see this lamb, and you can tell it, it looks about as innocent as you can get. It's playful, it's happy, it's jumping around. When it gets around other little lambs, they start playing together. And it's something really to, it's entertaining to watch. That's the life they were about to take. The innocent life of this ram. All the while, it was the individual, the person who sinned, who deserved to die. And this process was put in place to cause the priest to understand that the innocent life about to be taken was no one, not their own, and this lamb did not deserve to die. Thus, the taken blood, the shed blood, had a purpose. We see the whole ram was to be burned on the altar. And it made a sweet savor to God. This was not a mindless killing of animals. It was meant to be an emotional reckoning. To be an understanding to show the awful penalty for sin. Jewish worship via the sacrifice is detailed without, or throughout the book of Leviticus. We see the burnt offering listed, Leviticus chapter 1, chapter 6, verses 8 through 13, chapter 8, verses 18 through 21, a grain offering, Leviticus chapter 2, chapter 6, verses 14 through 23, 
Then there's a peace offering. Leviticus chapter 3 and chapter 7, verses 11 through 34. The sin offering, Leviticus chapter 4, chapter 5, verses 1 through 13. Chapter 6, verses 24 through 30. Then the trespass offering, Leviticus chapter 5, verses 14 through 19. Chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. And chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. Each of these sacrifices had certain elements and certain purposes. They all showed that sin would be covered but not removed. They removed, however, the power of sin to divide Israel from God. Consider the following sentiments from Kenneth R. Samples. It says, Biblically speaking, creatures derive their existence and their purpose for being directly from their creator. Creatures have no independent existence or rights apart from their creator. Creatures, by definition, therefore, lack total autonomy or complete independence and freedom. According to Scripture, animals were created by God ultimately to serve his purpose. Often those divine purposes directly involve helping human beings. Theologically speaking, God used animal sacrifices as a precursor of Jesus Christ's ultimate sacrifice. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 27. Animal sacrifices illustrated the idea of a substitute that offers or suffers wrath or punishment on the account of another's offense. Jesus Christ is the perfect substitute who suffers the wrath of God in the place of sinners. Isaiah chapter 53 verses 4 and 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21, 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 18. Animal sacrifices served God's purpose in teaching God's people, of course us today, about redemption. And that is indeed a very important purpose. Again, that comes from Kenneth R. Samples. Let's explore a little bit more in depth the significance and purpose of these Old Testament sacrifices, specifically under the law of Moses. They pointed to a better law and a better dispensation. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. These sacrifices are said to point to good things to come. They caused a remembrance of sin every year, but they could not actually be removed from Israel. Not to be in a flippant sense, but think of sin as a black wall. Think of these animal sacrifices as white paint. Every time they would offer these sacrifices, they would paint that black wall white. It will look fine until that paint dries. And then the black coat on the wall would still show through. In order to properly cover this white or this black wall, a kills primer paint would be necessary. That is the significance of the blood of Christ. It was able to properly cover and remove that black wall of sin. Fourth, we see that Jesus was the manifestation of these good things to come. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 6 through 15. This passage tells us many things. Old Testament sacrifices did not have the power to take away sin. However, the death of the perfect sacrifice could do exactly that, and that is Jesus. In his death, he paid the purchase price. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. His blood has the power to remove sin, not only for those living today under his covenant, but also under the previous laws that God had, has given. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 11 gives us a list of those worthies, as we refer to them as. And these worthies looked ahead to the promises. They knew that a better sacrifice would one day come, yet they never saw that sacrifice. As a result, 
they too could receive eternal salvation. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 13 through 16. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, an heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath pre prepared for them a city. This, this concept is echoed in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 24 through 28. And in the book of Zechariah, we find that it was prophesied that the blood of Christ would flow forwards and backwards, as it were. Zechariah chapter 13, verse 1. In that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and uncleanness. And then chapter 14, verse 8. says, And that shall be in that day that living waters shall go out from Jerusalem half of them toward the former sea, and half of them toward the hinder sea. In summer and in winter shall it be. So you see, those who were faithful to God under their respective dispensation would also have the saving power of Christ's blood applied to them. The same is true for all faithful today under the Christian dispensation. Romans chapter 1 verse 16. Now, how does one contact the saving blood of Christ today? This occurs in three ways. One contacts the saving blood of Christ in baptism. Today, some people claim that baptism is not essential to salvation. Others even claim that baptism is not a method of contacting Christ's blood. However, what does the Bible say? Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 and 6 says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, the princes of the kings of earth, unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. It is the, fact, the act of baptism that completes the alien sinner's initial obedience to the gospel. It is the point at which one's sins are initially cleansed. Acts chapter 22, verse 16. This mode of contact is offered to all of mankind. The second point of contact is by those who walk in the light. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. His blood continues to cleanse us from all of our sin. But this is contingent upon one's continued faithfulness. One must walk in the light. That is God's word. Maintaining fellowship with all other faithful members of the church as well as with God, but God primarily. Thus, this mode of contact is only offered to those faithful children of God. And the third point of contact, and that is contacting the blood of Christ, is observing the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is a memorial of His death. The cup, in fact, in a few moments we will be partaking of this as a way of worshiping God in spirit and in truth. Jesus said the cup of the Lord's Supper represents his blood that was shed for us. Matthew chapter 26, verses 27 and 28. Mark chapter 14, verses 23 and 24. And Luke chapter 22, verse 20. As well as 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 25. Thus, only Christians are qualified to contact bloods or Christ's blood in this manner. And as we do partake, we must do so in a worthy manner. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27. Now we know that 
God is not willing that any should perish, but rather that all men everywhere would come to repentance. 2 Peter chapter 3, the latter part of verse 9. He has shown and emphasized this simple fact to mankind. He has shown us that man is of more value than any other species. This is confirmed by Christ in Matthew chapter 6, verse 26. We must note and be mindful of that mankind ought to make God the center of his life. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And we must realize just how truly despicable sin is. Thus, we should appreciate the sacrifice of both the Father and the Son. John chapter 3, verse 16. John chapter 17, verse 8. And verses 21 through 26. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 7 through 9. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26, While it is Jesus the Christ who came to earth and suffered and bled upon the cross, God also sacrificed his son. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 32 and 33 says, For the perverse, the forward, or for those who ultimately depart from the way of righteousness, is abomination to the Lord, but his secret is with righteous, or his secret is with the righteous. The curse of the Lord is in the house of the wicked, but he blesseth the habitation of the just. God has provided a way for man to be reconciled to him. We've seen it all throughout time. We began back in the Garden of Eden. The first sin created by mankind, or committed by mankind, God had the remedy. And it was a sacrifice of an innocent animal. God covered their sins all the while knowing that one day in man's history, Jesus the Christ, the perfect sacrifice, would come to earth and thoroughly cleanse all of mankind from their sins and at least have that offered to them. That way is located in Christ, John chapter 14, verse 6. The way of rec reconciliation is within Christ. It was made possible by the shedding of his blood, and the life-giving power found therein. Have you been reconciled to God? If you're not a Christian, you have not been reconciled. You have not been able to come back to Christ, come back to God. But it's a matter of your own choosing. Why not choose to become a faithful follower of God, to render obedience to His will, ultimately being baptized for the remission of your sins? Therein you will contact the saving blood of our Savior. Or if you are a child of God, why not be reconciled to Him through confession of fault and repentance? If either of these are your need, please make it known now as together we stand and sing.